All right, let's go ahead and open up again to John 11. We'll be in that passage again today. John chapter 11. You know, in difficult trials, our emotions just are flooded with thoughts like, well, if he loves me, if God loves me, and he's powerful enough, then why am I going through this? You ever have that thought? Yes. Think of uh, John the Immerser. Remember him? He's languishing in prison, and it seems that his faith in Jesus begins to be shaken because he sends a messenger to Jesus to ask, are you the Messiah or are we to look for someone else? And so he's basically saying, look, if you are the Messiah, then what am I doing in this stinking prison? Why am I here? If John the Immerser could have doubts like this in times of trouble, in times of difficulty, in trials, then I think it's important for us to know how to deal with them. And so I want to take this afternoon and just uh, use John 11 as really a spot where we, we answer this question, why God allows suffering? And I, I don't think that these are all the answers, but there are five practical lessons about suffering in this chapter. There's, let me warn you, a little bit of overlap from the morning message if you were here for that, but it's always good to hear things again, isn't it? Repetition aids learning. So I want to share these five practical lessons about suffering from John chapter 11. You have your Bible and you have that uh, open. Let's pause a moment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for the time that we once again have this afternoon. Thank you for this place and for uh, the fellowship that we have together with each other. We've enjoyed that in the meal. Now, Lord, we just pray that our spiritual hearts would be in tune and that we would be open and that we would be saying, Lord, teach me. Show me what you want me to uh, see in this passage regarding the subject of why you allow your people to suffer. We just pray that we take from this precisely what you want us to get and that we would we'd be spiritually strengthened through it. Our hearts would be encouraged by it. We'd just take you at your word. We'd believe you. And uh, really all will be well. We just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Obviously, we're going to take time at the end of this where we can interact and you can have questions and uh, get further um, clarification on something perhaps that I didn't uh, state clearly, you didn't understand. I don't have all the answers, but uh, maybe all of us collectively can come up with an answer if I don't. But anyway, the first lesson that I, I want you to note from this passage is that God allows people that he loves to suffer. It's stressed several times here. Verse 3, the sister send to Jesus, behold him or he whom thou lovest is sick. Jesus uh, is said in verse 5 to have loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And then even back down, I think, in verse 36, we read that uh, the Jews, when Jesus wept, behold how he loved him. And so, first practical point, why does God allow suffering? Let's establish, first of all, the fact that God allows those that he loves to suffer. The emphasis being that God's people are to be in a loving relationship with him. And you are, if you're a child of God, you are the object of his love. You're his special object of love. And uh, I guess that's what makes this verse 6 such a surprising connection. Because it says in the fifth verse how much Jesus loved these 
And then in verse 6, and then when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he didn't immediately move. He stayed two days in the same spot where he was. That's surprising to us because we don't understand the special love that God has for his people as he did for these uh, followers, this family. His love for them, now get your mind around this, think about this. His love for them is the reason for his delay. Now we would think it'd be the opposite. That's counterintuitive to the way that we think, right? He stayed where he was knowing that Lazarus was deathly sick because he loved him. And I think it's this, that God's love, and that's the kind of love that Jesus has for them. I mentioned in the morning that the word loved in verse 5 is not talking merely about human affection that we would have as friends with one another, but it is the word that describes God's love. It's the kind of love that only God can put in a person's heart. And so Jesus, he loves them as God loves people. And as a result, he delays. And he allows them to suffer. Because, mark this down, God is a God that is so loving that he only allows in his people's lives those things which are best for them. Now, we may not think that what we're suffering is best for us, but I want us to always remember the fact that God is too loving to ever do us harm. God is too loving to ever do us harm. And God allows suffering in our life because he loves us that much. It may not feel like it, but suffering doesn't mean that Jesus doesn't love them or uh, didn't love them or doesn't love us. It actually means the opposite. If God allows his people to suffer, it means he loves them dearly. He loves them dearly. Again, that's not human thinking. That's not the way that we, uh, that's not where we end up when we think through these things. But God's love means that he gives to his people what they need the most. Not what they think they need, but what they really need the most. He allows suffering because he loves his people. And he, he knows what will bring us the most lasting and fullest joy. And so he allows these things into our lives. Really, the best thing that God can do for human beings is to reveal himself to us. And the way in which God reveals himself to us best is through suffering. And that's why he allows those that he loves to suffer, because he wants to reveal himself to us. And when God reveals himself to us, he knows that it will benefit us more than anything else. You know, God wants our worship. You know why he wants our worship? He wants our worship because he knows that's how he programmed us. That's how he made us. And when we truly worship him, it's to our advantage. It's the best thing that can happen to us. When we are right related to God and worship him, it's good for us. It's what makes humanity full and satisfied and joyful and full of all good things. And so God allows those he loves to suffer. You agree with that? Wait till the suffering comes. And then I'll ask you that again. Do you believe, do you believe that? Here's the second thing I want you to, to uh, think about, because this is what these, these uh, sisters do. In verse 3, they send a message to Jesus. It says, his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, him whom thou lovest is sick. Your good friend is sick. Third, uh, the second practical principle 
when we consider the subject, why God allows suffering is because he wants us to learn to take our troubles to him. Like these sisters did. Always take your troubles to Jesus. You may be unsure if Jesus is willing to heal you, but you simply need to learn to present your need to him and then just trust him to do what he chooses to let him decide what to do about it. You know, it's never wrong to pray for healing. It's just wrong to demand healing. Unless God convinces you that it is his will to heal you of uh, any particular sickness at, at any specific time, we have no right to demand or command him to heal. And someone said something to me uh, just recently about this whole matter of healing. And this is, this is a sidebar. This is kind of off the topic. About uh, speaking to the organ or to the body part that is sick, that is injured. There's nothing in the Bible like that. I've never seen anything in the Bible like that. You know, uh, laying the hand on uh, the, uh, uh, let's say, a, a heart ailment, laying the hand on the heart and, uh, and telling that heart to, you know, let go of the illness. This is the kind of stuff that often is going on in the, under the, the uh, guise of healing. That's not biblical healing, all right? But it's not wrong to pray for healing. And God certainly is the healer. And uh, sometimes he wills to heal people. It's always right to pray for healing. It's never right to demand it unless God has convinced your heart that it's his will to heal you. Then you can, you can ask him and expect it to happen. But getting back to the point, God allows suffering because he wants us to learn to take our troubles to him like these sisters did to appeal to him. And notice how they did so. They appealed to him on the basis of his love for their brother. That's how we do. That's how we pray. That's how we take our, our troubles to the Lord. We appeal to God. And we, we appeal to God on the basis of his love. And we're only asking God to do what brings glory to himself. This is very important. Jesus says in his message to those sisters, look, you need to understand something here. Even if your brother's dead, he was probably dead by the time this message was given. This sickness is not unto death. It's not going to end merely in your brother's death. But this sickness, your brother's death, is for the glory of God, that God might be glorified, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. And so when we do take our troubles to the Lord in suffering, we only ask for what will bring glory to God. And we don't know what that is always. We don't know what might bring glory to God. Sometimes it might bring more glory to God for that person, for the Lord to take that person home than for that person to linger. So we have to, when we do bring our troubles to the Lord, we only ask what would bring glory to God, and we don't always know what that is. And we also learn to bring those troubles dependent upon the Lord, dependent upon Jesus, putting our dependence fully in him and not ourselves, believing that God is able and he is willing to give what we ask for, especially if it's his will. And then I think, and this is this is a kind of a, I don't know, a gray area in the in uh, uh, the subject of praying for certain things that we're not sure is the will of God. Continue to pray to the Lord and don't stop until He tells you to. How does God tell us to stop praying about something? Well, sometimes He convinces us that okay, I hear you, and it you can expect it's going to be done. It's a done deal. And thus, you simply thank him when you pray, when the, 
when you pray about that thing, you simply, you change your prayer and you thank him for that answer, even though it hasn't been perhaps realized. But pray about it until God stops you from praying about it. And he does. He can lead us in that way. So why does God allow suffering? He does it because he loves us. And he does it because he's trying to teach us to learn to take our troubles to him. He wants us to learn to come to him. You know, just back on the subject of healing for a moment. On the basis of James chapter 5, verses 13 to 17, I'm convinced that uh, it's just as important for me to pray and to seek God's healing as it is for me to go to a doctor. I think, I'm not saying it's wrong to go to a doctor, but I think, why is the Lord the last resort? He should be the first one that we turn to when we have bodily ailments, I think. I think you can do both and still be biblical. But uh, I also want you to note just the, the way in which prayer for healing is set up in that James 5 passage. If any man is sick, if anyone is afflicted, let him call for the elders of the church. Not for faith healers, you know, not just anyone, but for the spiritual leaders in the church. Let him, the one that's sick, ask for that. Not the leaders come and say, hey, we're going to pray. Let them ask, and then the leaders of the church, they come and, aid, and they pray over that person. I think that's significant. But anyway, again, that's a side point. The third practical principle I want to talk about from John 11 regarding why God allows suffering is that we must always interpret our suffering by God's love for us. Don't interpret his love by your suffering. What I mean by that, it's wrong thinking to come to the conclusion that God doesn't love me because he allows me to suffer. That's totally off base. You need to learn to interpret your suffering by God's love. And that is that, uh, that God loves you, and that's why he's allowing this, because he's always seeking only what is best for you, his children. Because... He is going to give you the biggest vision of God's glory that will enable him to do wonders in your life. Think of the difference that this suffering made, not only the life of Lazarus, but the life of his, his family and his friends as well. And so God wants to use it. Listen to this. I This is a quote from a book by... Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata, who was uh, uh, who is a paraplegic as a result of a diving accident when she was just a teenage girl. Here's what she said about her accident. God engineered the circumstances. He used them to prove himself as well as my loyalty. Not everyone had this privilege. I felt there were only a few people God cared for in such a special way that he would trust them with this kind of experience. This understanding left me relaxed and comfortable as I relied on his love, exercising newly learned trust in him. I saw that my injury was not a tragedy, but a gift of God, a gift God was using to help me conform to the image of Christ something that would mean my ultimate satisfaction, happiness, and even joy. Here's a, a woman, as a young lady, that learned to interpret her suffering on the basis of the fact that God loved her. And that's why he allowed this suffering in her life. Fourth thing, and it's this. Realize that love sometimes involves delays that are not understood at the time. And of course, going back to the early verses there in John chapter 11, where Jesus gets the message of Lazarus' sickness, and then deliberately, when he had heard that message, 
he abode two days still in the same place where he loved, where, where he lived, where he was staying. So realize that love sometimes involves delays that we may not understand why at the time. In fact, the two sisters didn't because they both repeated in verse 21 and verse 32 the same thing. If you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. That's what they said. This whole event of our brother's death is an unnecessary thing. You could have prevented it. If you just would have come, it wouldn't have happened. Love sometimes involves delays that are not understood at the time. And they didn't, but they eventually did, didn't they? They failed to see the reason for the delay. Yet we know that the reason for the delay was because he loved them. And that's the reason he loved them because he wanted to reveal his glory and his power in, into their lives that would cause them to be personally, spiritually strengthened and, and grow. And the, the Bible challenges us oftentimes, especially in the book of the Psalms, which is a book about troubles and how they're dealt with rightly. Wait on the Lord, right? Wait on the Lord. Uh, why? Because this is a growing process. This is a good thing, this delay. Delay of answers to prayer doesn't mean that God doesn't care, doesn't mean that God is indifferent, that God is busy, but he is seeking to build strong, trusting, lasting relationship with us. That's what the delay is about. He, he wants to use it to drive us deeper in our relationship with him. Now, I understand God runs the risk, if we can put it that way, of losing us uh, through sufferings because we don't like it uh, or we don't, we don't trust, we don't believe what the Bible says. And so he runs the risk, so to speak, of losing us. But you know what? It's all right. God never quits. God, the last chapter hasn't been written. You and I both know people that perhaps have strayed from the Lord or have walked away from the Lord because of some difficulty or intense suffering that has gripped their life. Well, keep praying because the last chapter, again, of their life hasn't been written yet. God's at work in their life. It doesn't mean it's all over. And so the Lord, his delays may not be understood at the time, but you can mark it down. He's got a great purpose. He loves us, and he's not going to do us wrong. He's not going to do us harm. And the fifth and final lesson that I want to touch on is in that fourth verse where Jesus gives that message for the messenger to take back to the sisters. The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Here is the bottom line lesson. Here is the overarching truth. Why does God allow suffering? Again, all the answers aren't here in this chapter, but suffering is always, without exception, suffering is always for God's glory. Always for God's glory. We often ask why, but it's not always that we are to know why. But we know why we're here, don't we? Don't ever forget why you're here. Don't ever forget why you're breathing, why your heart's beating, why you're alive, why you exist, why you're surviving. Why are you here? You're here for God's glory. You're not here for yourself. You're here for the glory of God. And uh, all that that entails in the book of Romans and chapter 11, it's a wonderful chapter about God's future restoration of the people of Israel. And Paul at the end just breaks out in praise when he thinks about the wisdom of God's plan. And he says, all the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Think God needs a counselor? 
Or who hath first given to him, and shall it be recompensed unto him again? Does God uh, need anything? Then he says, for of him, this is God, of him, through him, to him, are all things. To whom be glory forever and ever. God's glory is far, far greater than any of our losses, any of our suffering. It's the way that we see God's glory. Our suffering is the way that God reveals his glory. And, uh, and we, we get to admire the glory of God that we'd never, never even see otherwise. We get to marvel and savor God's glory that he reveals to us through suffering. Let me give you a couple of ways in which God's glory is revealed in salvation. You know, that's exactly what happened. Again, I remind you of verse 45. It says that then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen these things which Jesus did believed on him. The glory of God was revealed in the raising of Lazarus, right? Wow! And it was that revealed glory of God that brought salvation to these people. Our suffering. Why? To reveal the glory of God. And it, and it could be through our suffering that one of the ways in which God's glory is revealed, young people, is that God will use our suffering to reveal his power and his glory that people might be saved. In fact, I think it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where the, the comfort and the consolation that God has brought to us in our suffering, we are to share with others. And it's a means whereby we minister. The glory of God ministered to our heart and our suffering can be ministered to other hearts as well. And not only that, the glory of God is not only revealed in our suffering, but the glory of God uh, uh, in, our, in the salvation of people, but the glory of God is revealed also in the sanctification of Christian people. I think it's verse uh, 40 that I'm thinking of where Jesus said to Martha, if thou wouldest, didn't I say if you would believe, you'd see the glory of God. And as a result of her seeing the glory of God, let me tell you, she was different. And look at what it did for Mary. In the next chapter, Mary takes a pound of very expensive perfume and she anoints the feet of Jesus and she does a amazing, worshipful thing. And it was a result of the glory that was revealed there in the raising of Lazarus, who she lost. And then he brought back to life. Remember that verse in Romans 8? We know it. All things work together for good to them that love God and are the called according to his purpose. And the next verse tells us how that's true. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And so there it is. The glory of God is not only revealed in the and resulting in the saving of souls, but in the conforming of the believer to Christ's image, as we see evidenced in this family itself, in Mary and Martha. It, it brings you closer to the Lord. That's why God allows suffering. I read a story, true story, about a woman that was overwhelmed with grief. She was approached at church by a little seven-year-old boy after her mother had passed. And the little boy came up to her with tears in his eyes. And he looked up to her and he said, I prayed for your mother, but she died. And for a moment, the, the woman, uh, she didn't know what to say. She didn't know whether to hug him and cry with him or what, but she silently asked the Lord to give her wisdom to know how to respond to that. 
And she said, you wanted God to do his best for my mother, didn't you? The little boy nodded, yeah. Well, God answered your prayer. His best was for her to be taken home to live with him. The little boy got it. His eyes lightened up. And uh, he said, that's right, he did. And he ran to meet his friends and just happy that it was that, that was the answer. It should be that simple for us, too. It really should. That's how God works. That's why he allows suffering in our life. He does so. Again, let me review these things. Because he loves you. Because he wants to teach you to bring your troubles to him. And he wants you to learn to interpret your suffering by his love. And because... He needs you and I to understand that there are sometimes delays that we may not understand at the time, but real love still exists and that it's always for his glory.